I, I understand if you haven't been through it and you don't get it and, you know, they've been here a million times and, oh my gosh, they're back and they're acting and, you know, they're acting a fool and, you know, yelling and yeah, I get the frustration. I do, but like, I always say we're in the ER. The, we are not long-term care for these people. Yes. So yeah. why can't we just be a soft place for them to land? Just, we only have them for a short time. Just for a know? minute. Yeah. yeah. Give them a sandwich. Yeah. Like, I know they've had two already and I get that we want some for other patients, but I didn't pay for those sandwiches. I sure didn't. And, um, my pocket. <laughs> uh, you know, it's like, all they want, I'm telling you the patients that I hear are so rude or mean or this or that aren't that mean. Do they just want someone to talk to them? Like they're a human. If you're just kind, like just be kind, just be kind. Yes. Hello, and welcome to the Art of Emergency Nursing podcast. This is where we share stories for inspiration, entertainment, and encouragement, because we all know emergency nurses have the best stories. Now here's your host, Kevin McFarland. Hey everybody, Kevin McFarland here from the Art of Emergency Nursing, and thanks so much for downloading this episode. Don't forget, as I always remind you, leave a rating and review. That's what helps people find this podcast, and I would really appreciate it if you did that, if you haven't done so already. Now, before we get started, I wanted to let you know how excited I am to be a part of this cool event that's happening on November 20th. On November 20th, I'll be joining a group of nursing podcasters to be a part of the first ever Nursing Pod Con. Your favorite podcasters are going to be there doing a full day of education and live podcast episodes. Some of the top nursing podcasts are going to be there doing their show. There's going to be CEs available for the event as well, so you can check that box as well. I am thrilled to be part of this event. If you're going to be in the Nashville area next month on the 20th, you can come be part of this event. Tickets are available on the Good Nurse, Bad Nurse website. Take a look at the website for all the details and find out who all is going to be there. Make sure you're following me on social media because I'm going to give away tickets to this event, uh, probably on Instagram. Now, I want to take a second and thank the sponsors who are making this whole thing possible. The sponsors include Trusted Health, Echo Stethoscopes, CBD Stat, Samuel Merritt University, and Stoggles. Thank you so much to these amazing sponsors for making this nursing PodCon happen. It is going to be a blast. I hope I get to see you in Nashville. All right, for today's episode, I have a doozy for you. My guest today is a fairly new nurse, but she has an amazing story. This episode is going to be a two-part episode, so make sure you come back later this week to hear the rest of the story. Now enjoy this episode with my friend, Danielle. Okay. Um, my name is Danielle, and I have been an ER nurse since July of last year, so not very long. Um, I love it, and it's the only job I've had as a nurse, so it's kind of cool that I got hired on as a new grad. Um, I was surprised, but, you know, happy to start somewhere a little more fast paced and, um, my clinicals, I like the turnover in the ER. So I was like, I would love that. And I, there was an opportunity. So I interviewed and got it. So I was really, really excited about that. That's awesome. So you started as a new grad in the emergency department. That's super yeah. cool. Oh yeah. <laughs> super cool. <laughs> but, but, but during a pandemic, like that's, that's kind of bad timing, but. I've never known it any differently. So everyone's like, oh my gosh, it's so bad now. I'm like, I don't, I don't know like, what it was like before. <laughs> so yeah, you don't have the context. You don't have the context right. to be like, hey, I remember yeah. what, I remember when I first started in the emergency department. This is before I was a nurse, when I was a tech, when I first started in the emergency department, the 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 emergency department I worked in was a busy ER. Mm -hmm. But at like midnight, the place just became a ghost town. So from midnight until about five in the morning, we were usually would have like Overnights, we usually didn't have patients. We, you know, we'd have a handful of patients, but we yeah. didn't have much. Um, you know, I think we staffed with what three nurses, maybe in a tech, wow. um, and and we were okay. Like we felt like we were doing pretty good. And then, you know, now, like I can't even imagine like that that same ER that I that I started in. You know, they have twenty nurses that, that do an overnight shift now. That's so, yeah, yeah. Uh, so you'll, you'll have an interesting perspective that, that you, this is the only nursing you've known. 
this, mm-hmm. you know, post pandemic mm-hmm. or, or pandemic, not even post pandemic yeah. uh, nursing. So yeah. How are your clinicals? Did you get, did you have actual clinicals during your nursing program? I Cause it did up until all the, in March, the um, world changed. they were like, no more, no more in-person clinical. So I actually got to, I don't want to say got to, but I had to miss my med surge rotation. So I didn't ever I'm like, oh, darn. which is fine. I, I, I was okay with that. I think I already knew I didn't want to do med surge. I don't, I don't know. I got a taste of the ER when I was doing my clinical and I was like, kind of just had my heart set on that. So, but yeah, I was not able to do my um, med surge clinical. So we did everything else terrible. online. Uh, I am literally a <laughs> internet porn nurse. I don't know. <laughs> not really, but <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, 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 this generation of nurses is going to be just a little bit different than everyone else. Cause a lot of the folks, a lot of the folks just coming out of school didn't have clinicals. Mm-mm. You know, some yeah. of our nurse residents that we have in our, we have a nurse residency program at uh, the hospital I work at. And some of them didn't have any clinical. That's Wow. It was all online. And yeah. that to me is crazy, but, yeah. but that's the reality. Mm-hmm. So yeah. now when you got hired on, were you part of a residency program or just, just hired into the ER? Nope. Just hired into the ER. Um, I, I, I worked as a unit clerk for um, a mental health facility. And one of the nurses that worked there worked also at the hospital I work now. Um, and she was like, well, our ER is hiring. And I'm like, do you think that they'd hire a new grad? And I was, you know, and then I also spoke with um, one of their recruiters at a, a job fair for the company that I work for. And so kind of made those two um, contacts, I guess, and then got an er- interview with the manager. I mean, of course I had to fill out everything, you know. Um, of course. Yeah, but I, yeah, I just interviewed and it was on lo- or over the phone interview, which- oh. That's fine. I, I was, I was scheduled to meet with her, um, in the hospital was told where to go and all the things. And then everything happened. She was quarantining on those, you know, during that time. So that was postponed. Um, so a week later it was a phone call. So I phone interviewed for the job and was offered the position through that, which I was relieved to have the phone <laughs> conversation. I mean, it was kind of a bigger, it is a big break <laughs> because, you know, I didn't have to, I could hide whatever nervousness was on my face. Yeah. So <laughs> I don't know. I, you gonna... know, I've had the opportunity to do a few phone interviews and phone interviews are so hard. Phone, phone interviews are so hard because you don't, there's so much you get just seeing somebody, mm-hmm. being face to face with somebody. Definitely. And, and, and a little inside baseball for people who are listening to this podcast, where, where when you hear this audio, this podcast, you're hearing me and my guests just kind of talk, but we're looking at each other. Yeah. And, and it, it just makes a big difference to be able to see somebody's face and look mm-hmm. them in the eye. Yeah. And, and if you don't have that, it makes it a different interview. Mm-hmm. It's a different yes. interview. And it's it, what I found for me as, a, as an interviewer, it's harder to say yes and much easier to say no. Mm -hmm. Um, and it made me much more critical of the people I interviewed. Right. Um, I remember interviewing one guy and and just kind of some of the stuff he said, I was sitting there thinking to myself, man, this guy's going to be like a hundred years old. And, and of course you, you you don't ask people their age and you don't Mm -hmm. ask people those things that that could lead you to discrimination. And Mm -hmm. I'm sure there's a wonderful hundred year old ER nurse somewhere. Um, but, but, you know, I was kind of going, "Eh." and he goes, you know, I'm going to be in town tomorrow. Um, He's like, do you mind if I come by and get a, get a tour of your, your department? I was like, that would be fantastic. Yeah. And, and I couldn't have been more wrong with what I thought, you know, right. I, what, you know, I was expecting to see this, you know, hundred year old guy come in the door, you know, and, and, yeah. and no, he wasn't, he was a, you know, big, younger strapping guy. And he was just like, <laughs> oh yeah. He's like, he's looking around because I'd love this place. And I was awesome. like, awesome. There you go. Awesome. So interviews are hard. Interviews yeah. are hard. They are. So, so you landed your job as a, as an ER nurse mm-hmm. right out of school. Mm-hmm. That's super exciting in and of yeah. itself. What was your orientation like? Did you have good orientation? So, no, no. <laughs> I, 
it was, uh, well, onboarding was just a week of, you know, meeting at yeah. uh, sister hospital, you know, getting the, just kind of the paperwork and stuff out the of the way modules. Done. Yeah. But I feel like my orientation was, and maybe it's because I'm sensitive. I am sensitive. Maybe that's why, but, <laughs> and maybe my preceptor was going through a hard time in life. I don't know, but she was sort of the definition of um, eat your young. Because <laughs> mm, she was oh, like, I hate hearing that. Oh, she was very condescending, very um, just harsh. And, you know, I, I don't know. There were actually nurses that kind of went to bat for me to the manager. They were like, she's not being very nice to her. <laughs> and I was like, That's oh my. Bad. so they gave me another preceptor, which was kind of actually relieving. Um, and like I said, she could have very well been going, you know, I don't know what her life situation yeah, was like at the time. Um, so, but I was paired with somebody else and then, yeah, it was much better. And I felt more comfortable to ask questions and, you know, learn because it's hard to feel scared to ask a question that's not safe yeah, for anybody yeah. and so yeah and know. that's what that's one of the things that gets new nurses in trouble like if you don't feel like you have a safety net that you can go yeah. to and, and and ask questions and mm -hmm. you know and, and have a safe place for you to learn your practice mm -hmm. yeah then you never do and you could be doing something completely wrong and you'd have no idea yeah. so because you yeah. never asked the question right so what made you decide to become a nurse so it's kind of funny because when I, I did move out here, um, I was, you know, new place. Um, I moved here from Arizona and my aunt was like, you know, come out here for a fresh start kind of thing. And um, I was pregnant at the time. So, you know, I was kind of focused. I, I stayed, um, I stayed a few nights at her house when I first got here. And then I went to a 28 day program. And then I got out and kind of just focused on having my baby and, you know, kind of that sort of thing. Um, but I was like, what am I going to do with my life? <laughs> you know, like, I'm not going to live the life I used to. What in the world could I do? And when I was 19, I went to dental assisting school, which, you know, didn't work out very well. But, um, you know, so I always thought that I loved the dental field. I don't know. And maybe it was something I told myself. Clearly I didn't, I didn't stick with it. So maybe I didn't love it as much as I thought, but I don't know. I just had this idea. Like, I think um, I'm going to be a nurse. I'm going to become a nurse. It was really that, <laughs> I don't know. And what I did though, I called the state board of nursing here and I was like, Hey, um, I got a question. So here's my situation. I was still a felon. Um, I was, you know, I told them my situation and they were like, it doesn't rule you out. Um, it's a case by case basis. Um, and then at that point I had hope. So I, I was like, I'm going to do it. I'm just going to do it. <laughs> so I signed oh up God. for school and started my pre prerequisites, uh, January, 2014. Wow. Good for yeah. you. Yeah. It was kind of a, I mean, looking back, I obviously know now, you know, why I wanted to do it and why God made a way for me to do it. But, you know, yeah, trust me. Everyone was like, oh, okay, you're going to be a nurse. That's great. <laughs> sure. Mm. Good luck with that. Oh, my gosh. Oh, they're like, okay. Right, right. Yes. My aunt was like, you should just stop now. There's no way you can be a nurse with your record. And I was like, I don't know. I was like, I called them. I, I told them my story. <laughs> so I no. Now you're now for, for the audience, yes. there, there's a story, there's a story to be had there. So here you are a new mom at, at this time or, or pregnant. So, I mean, I guess we could go I, I, back, we're, back. Yeah, we're, 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 we'll, we'll go, we'll go back, back in a minute, but, okay. but, um, but here yes, you are, here you are a new, a new mom. Mm -hmm. um, and you decide you, you get the inspiration that you want to be a nurse. Mm -hmm. But you got this background, this mm -hmm. background that you, you said you were a felon. Yes. And, and that might preclude you from being, that might preclude you from being a nurse. Right. 
Um, and, and so you called the nursing board and you're like, hey, let's look into this. Yeah. Now, now I, I, I got to tell you, I know two people who did the same thing. I know two people who did the same thing. And, and one was um, pretty deep in his nursing clinicals. And they were like, yeah, you're not going to be a nurse. Wow. They were like, ain't happening. Now, his was different. His was, um, his, his, he had a, he had a, his felony was that he, um, he, I don't even know what they called it. Um, was it a crime uh, against a person? And slaughter. <laughs> there you go. And slaughter. So <laughs> it's a long story. The guy really was a good guy. Um, right. Long story, but he, he, he had a history of, he had a manslaughter charge in his history and, and it was long before he right. did all the amazing things he did. Right. Um, but he, as he was kind of going through, someone was like, hey, you, you may want to talk to somebody about this and make sure this is yeah. going to work out. Yeah. And they were like, no way, no how. Mm-hmm. And, and he had a license in another healthcare um, industry. He had, wow. he had a, he had a, 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 he was a paramedic. He had an active paramedic license. And, and they were like, yeah, manslaughter charge? No, probably not going to be a nurse. <laughs> and, and he was devastated. Oh, yeah. Like devastated. And I, 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 I'll, I'll never forget having that conversation. I'm like, dude, get through nursing school and then have the conversation again because things may change. Um, but the, in my mind, I was thinking that might be bad advice. Um, <laughs> I, I know someone else who had kind of drug related charges and they were like, Hey, he was like, Hey, you know, I, I think I might want to do, do this. And they were like, maybe. Mm-hmm. And they, they said, what they said to you case by case basis. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and that for him didn't end well. Um, oh, wow. but, but it was one of those where like, but he never, like he didn't, he certainly didn't finish and he certainly mm-hmm. didn't like pursue it then. So, right. So here you are brand new mom. Felony background, decide you want to be a nurse, and they're like, uh, maybe yeah, it could work out. Mm-hmm. And you're like, let's do this. I get that you're like, that's enough to give you hope. Yeah, to carry on and do what you're do what you decided you wanted yeah. to do. What I always told myself was, if it's a case by case basis, then all I'm going to have to do is give them my testimony of what I've done and what God's done in my life, and so that's fine with me. <laughs> That's just kind of the attitude I had to have. Um, of course, there were doubts. Of course, I'm like, what am I doing? Like, this is not, yeah. And, you know, I did have my doubts and I did go through my, the hard times and the failures and the, all the things, but I just, I don't know. God kept me going. <laughs> kept you going and got you through it. Yes. That's and I knew cool. that. It was not a crime against a person. Um, I know that my felony was, it's much different than a lot. <laughs> my problem was I had a possession of dangerous drug paraphernalia charge, uh, okay. which could have seriously been dropped had I just completed their um, diversion program. But I was so far into that lifestyle that I couldn't even complete that. Wow. So I got a warrant, would get arrested, get released on probation, not follow through, get a warrant. And I did that for years and years and it was horrible. Wow. Yes. It, and so unnecessary. So the last time that I was arrested again, I revoked my probation and said, just send me to prison. Let me do the rest of my time for this felony. I think it was a class six. So it's like the, not a, not a bad felony, not a violent. Yeah. Like class six doesn't mean like, it's a really big felony. It means it's like, okay, this is, this just happens to be a felony. Like you could have gotten that knocked down, but (laughs) yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, that's kind of why I had, you know, I went to prison for it and it's like, yeah, totally avoidable. But I was so far into my addiction. I, I couldn't pass a drug test for years so wow Mm -hmm. let's talk a little bit about your addiction um tell 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 the audience a little bit about that like what what happened like when when did it start how did how did this Um, happen so i was definitely um i don't know a good kid i guess you could say for you know all of my teen years i wasn't you know into any 
anything crazy. I know my brothers, I had older brothers, they kind of were, but I was not that way. Um, but at 23, um, I was recently divorced. I married pretty young, never even lived with a guy before we moved to Arizona, um, from California. That's where I did live. Um, to be near my sister-in-law and brother. Uh, I look back now and I realize I was for sure suffering from depression. I did not know that's what it was or, um, I absolutely know it is now, but I, I didn't know that that was why I had such a hard time doing life, you know, doing adult life. <laughs> like I just struggled so much, um, keeping a job, you know, I could get them fine keeping them because I would wake up days and I don't know. So I think I began to self-medicate in that way. Um, first with alcohol, uh, and it wasn't every day at first or anything, but um, it did numb me. It did, you know, so it just progressed. Um, and eventually, you know, when you live in that lifestyle long enough, you meet different people here, or there, you know. So for me, I I began doing meth when I was 20, 23. Um, 22 is when I was married. So yeah, 23, I started doing meth. Um, my husband and I were actually doing it together. I Holy cow. And we were like Christians when we got married. I, I received the Lord when I was 17. I was hardcore Christian. I loved God. And so for all of this to kind of like happen was very, I don't know. It was, it so, just was a snowball effect. <laughs> so how do you go from, how do you go from alcohol to, to meth? Cause that's a big jump. It is. Um, like I know, I know a lot, I know a lot of nurses <laughs> use, use alcohol right now. Yes. So big jump for meth. This is um one part of my story I did not share online, which I mean it, it'll help people connect dots, I guess, because that does sound kind of like how what, how did that happen? But so I was so naive. Um, me and my husband were actually at a bar one night karaoke, and I met this girl, and she was really nice, and you know we're talking, and she's like, you know, I was like, what do you do for a living? And she's like, I'm a dancer. I'm like. Like ballet, I literally said that. And she's like, like yeah, no, like ballet. A dancer. I'm like, oh, oh my gosh. Like I have never, and oh my gosh. I was like, whoa, like I was shocked. And, but I stayed for, we exchanged numbers and yeah, I ended up going to that club with her and auditioning very intoxicated one night. And started my career as a dancer myself. Okay. <laughs> and that is how the, the meth came into play because I, there was. Now, I would imagine, I, and uh, clearly looking at me, I've never been a dancer. Um, but, but I would imagine, like, if you are kind of depressed mm -hmm. and, uh, an and, and an alcoholic, mm -hmm. dancing, it's, it's going to be trouble. It's going to be trouble because I, oh. I would imagine, I would imagine like it, it probably doesn't lend itself to making you feel good about yourself. Right. There's not um, a night I did that sober. No way. Uh -huh. And I was still married and he was like, oh my gosh, you know, he was, I don't know. He was just kind of along for the, I don't know. He wasn't not, he was not a very stern guy he wasn't like uh-uh not my wife he was like uh whatever well, well, so you and, know and, and here's here's my guess it yeah. it probably pays okay yeah where you're like you're like well you know i know you don't like it however yeah yeah and so yeah uh so three months into that i met a girl that you know did that and that that's really I had tried it a few times when I was younger with my older brother. He is the first one who ever actually gave me meth. Wow. Um, so I had done it a few times when I was younger, but it was never, I mean, I would do it and then it would be like, I don't know, months and months, maybe a year goes by. I wouldn't, I wasn't like trying to do it all the time. I was like, oh my gosh, why did I do that? And I always felt horrible. Um, so, you know, I had done it before. So when she introduced it to me again, I was like, yeah, I've done this. And it was a lot easier to do it all the time 
when I was doing that. So, yeah. Yeah. Any other drugs in between there? So from alcohol to meth, there was there, was there anything else? No. Um, I mean, yeah, I've, I tried other things, um, but nothing ever stuck like that. It was gotcha. alcohol and meth for me. And I, I could say my drug of choice was alcohol. Um, oh. and you know, obviously and meth, but being intoxicated allowed me to want to do the other things. So, yeah. so yeah. Wow. Yeah. So that's kind of how I started doing that. And then my husband, we were young. He had really supportive parents back home, you know, things were not going well and he left and I, I'm glad he did. I'm so glad that he didn't stay and go down any kind of a path that I ended up going down, you know? So I'm grateful for that, that he went home and he was, you know, safe and better. And he, you know, but I stayed and for two years, I drank, did meth and I danced and I, everything in between and um, what kind of interrupted that whole lifestyle that I was doing is, um, I got pregnant. Um, I had like, I had a boyfriend at the time, uh, clearly not a ideal relationship considering, but, um, yeah, I, I moved to my mom's and, you know, out in California and tried to do the right thing there. Um, that wasn't a good situation. So I moved back to Arizona. Um, I tried to live in Colorado with the father. Um, he had moved back home to his family. And so I didn't have anywhere to like go in Arizona. Um, my brother and sister-in-law, uh, the only family that I did have out there, we were kind of, um, uh, estranged or we just did not talk like we used to. So, um, yeah, I didn't really have anywhere to find support. So I had my daughter, um, I was clean when I had her. Um, and I, now were you, were, were you, were you, now you mentioned that you had kind of an estranged relationship with your yeah. brother and, and, and like having, having been around people on drugs like that, that's not even a little bit surprising like that. Right. Right. If they're not, if they're not that, you know, if they're not in that lifestyle, then Absolutely. there's going to be, there's going to be certainly some, some distance mm -hmm. there. Cause oh, you're yeah. like, Hey, what are you doing? Yeah. Um, were you clean throughout your pregnancy? Mm -mm. No, no, I wasn't. And of course, you know, that's hard to admit, but I mean, oh. it's the truth, you know? So, but, um, I had her, uh, and I, I was not able to change. Like, I just, I don't know. I look back myself and just, you know, why couldn't I have done better for her? But, um, but my brother and sister-in-law actually ended up adopting her. Um, they cut me off though, completely. Um, so I hadn't seen her since she was one, but, um, but yeah, and I haven't talked to them since. So holy cow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Uh the good news is that she did okay with that. Was she was she okay with them? I yeah. I I I have other, you know, obviously we're family, so it's not, you know, you can yeah. only not talk to me so much, but you know, I have other people that have informed me of, you know, that she's you know, she's happy and all that. So that makes me very at peace, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and there's a lot of forgiveness that I've had to allow God to do in myself. Um, Cause if I couldn't do that, I couldn't move on. You know, I, when she was taken for me, I got even worse than I ever was. And yeah, it was. Now, now, so she was taken from you. She was, that wasn't a, that wasn't a, Hey, here, help me out here. It was more of a, mm -hmm. yeah, you're, you're not ready for this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Wow. That's so, tough. That's tough was. for, for everyone involved. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, that had to be a tough situation, a tough conversation to have and a tough mm -hmm. conversation on, on both sides. Yeah. So. And it was the right thing. It was just, but yeah, it was gut wrenching. Yeah. I bet. So, but yeah, definitely a, a big uh, regret from yeah. that, from that life, but 
but, but you mentioned after that you got worse. I did. Um, you know, any kind of depression I thought I had before. Uh, yeah, it's just gonna. Yeah. Exponent. So I make it so much worse. Started shooting up, and I—I I mean, you would not see me without a bottle of vodka in my hand. Wow. Yeah. It's kind of strange to look back, just because. I feel like I'm telling the story of like somebody else's life. I bet you do. I bet this, I mean, looking at where you are now, this has to feel like another lifetime, almost like another life. For sure. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. You mentioned that you started using shooting up. Mm -hmm. Were you, were you just smoking before? Yeah. Yes. And, and this is, this is just my naive, my naiveness. I don't know. Um, but my my assumption has always been like if you're smoking meth, that's bad enough. But when oh, you yeah. start shooting up meth, like this is gonna this is gonna go poorly. Mm -hmm. Right. So I never okay. I I obviously can look back and go, the Lord's hand was on my life, protecting me completely because people don't often recover from that. It's not yeah. common. Um, I never got to the point where I was, um, I didn't do the paranoid thing. I didn't understand when people got like that, that never happened to me. I, but I was also always drinking. So I don't know. I was never, um, I don't know. I was always, kind of, <laughs> I felt too, uh, anxious when I didn't drink and just did that. So I, I don't know. I just kind of, um, I don't know. I feel like I stayed more, um, in my mind, <laughs> I was more sane than most people around me. Um, I felt like I had, uh, I don't know. Plus I knew the Lord beforehand. And I think that had a lot to do with my uh, misery in that lifestyle. Always yeah. knowing I was meant for more or knowing that what I was doing was wrong. You know, so I, I guess that helped me to, to, you know, not fully immerse my soul into that lifestyle because I just knew always it wasn't who I was supposed to be. Because what we see a lot in the emergency department, and you you know this as an ER nurse, what we see a lot with the emergency department is is not only do those drugs kind of wreck your life, but like all the stuff that goes with it, the all the stuff that goes with it, with you know being able to afford it and things that like just all the lifestyle around it is just We're not fine. good. Like no. it, none of it's good. No, it's awful. And, and, you know, whenever I see, whenever I see a person who is in the emergency department and they're on drugs, I, I just think to myself, like, boy, like they, they don't have an easy life. Things are not easy for them. This is, right. you know, they're, you know, and, and I've heard nurses say, oh, they just sit around and get high all day. I'm like, no, no, no. It's way worse than that. It's mm -hmm. way worse than that. I'm glad you say that because um, that's been a huge thing for me is um nobody when they're a child is like when I grow up I want to be, I wanna be a an addict right I want to be um some yeah homeless all the things that go along with it nobody nobody says that and when you see people in the ER that are the result of their choices um oh my gosh the pain that they've got to be in to have gotten themselves there. I, I can't even imagine. And, 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 you know, I always, I always say all the time, I'm, I'm incredibly blessed. I've been incredibly blessed. Um, it, but when I see people and I'm like, you know, that's not an easy choice. Like that, mm -hmm. like, like getting there, getting there was rough. Getting out of there is even rougher. Mm -hmm. Um, but boy, you have no idea what these people are going through. Yeah. Um, in so many, so many ways that you're just like, you don't even know. You don't even I know feel, how bad this could be. I feel blessed because I do know, you know, and yeah. that is a really cool um, takeaway from all of the things I've been through instead of like, I don't know, being in the position I'm in now, I'm so grateful to come face to face with these people. Um, and I can tell them, I, I don't talk about, well, my story is everywhere. So people know, but I don't, you know, talk about it as much as you know I bet but when I'm with a patient that I relate to 
I absolutely tell them, I know where you've been. And I, I let them know that I know, I know. And I've sometimes shown patients like my before and after picture <laughs> and they're just like, oh my God, you know what I mean? And it's, yeah. I, it's awesome. I've prayed with patients. I've, you know, I hugged patients, cried with them because I know what it's like. And I know what it's like to be around people that treat you like you're less than because you are like that, that you are a nobody because you did it to yourself. God, it just irritates the fuck out of me. Excuse, excuse my language. I'm sorry. I'm a little bit of a potty mouth. It, it just irritates me so bad because people like so, some nurses can be so judgmental Oh my God. and some nurses can be so heartless, heartless. and so like <laughs> Like, oh, they did this to themselves. I'm like, mm-hmm. I'm like, screw you. That's what meth will do. Are. Don't do meth kids. You know, we hear all the, you know. Yeah. And, and, um, yeah. and, and you, you hear people get, you know, real indig- indigenous sometimes. And you're just like, you don't even know. You don't even know what these people have been through. Just, just be kind to them. Yeah. Like somebody, somebody loves this person in front of you. Exactly. And if you treat every patient like somebody loves them, mm-hmm. then how can you be how can then you're you nursing. Kind to them? Then that then you're nursing. Yeah, then then that's what nurses do. <laughs> right. That's what nurses it's do. what I thought. That's what I had thought. <laughs> so <sighs> it is, it's hard, it's hard to um to see that kind of mentality. And of course, you know, and I, I, I understand if you haven't been through it and you don't get it, and you know, they've been here a million times and oh my gosh, they're back and they're acting, and you know, they're acting a fool and you know, yelling and, and yeah, I get the frustration. I do, but like I always say, we're in the ER. The, we are not long-term care for these people. Yeah, so man. why can't we just be a soft place for them to land? Just, we only have them for a short time. Just for you a know? minute. Yeah. 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 Um, I'm not a big, uh, so, you know, when they're back in the psych unit and they want a sandwich, give them a sandwich. Yeah. Like- I know they've had two already and I get that we want some for other patients, but I didn't pay for the sandwiches. I sure didn't. Not and um, my pocket. <laughs> uh, you know, it's like all they want. I'm telling you, the patients that I hear are so rude or mean or this or that aren't that mean. Do they just want someone to talk to them like they're a human? If you're just kind, like just be kind. Just be kind. Yes. So, so going, going back to your story. So here you are, you, you, you've went from smoking meth to now shooting meth. Yeah. And, and where did that lead you? Um, all over, uh, just, uh, living, I never had my own place. I was always going from, you know, couch to couch. Um, I have another brother that he lived out there in Arizona too. He moved out there after me and my brother and, you know, we did, and he has an, a drug problem as well. And me and him were very close out there. We basically, I don't know if you want to call it ran the streets together, but you know, we were close. So when I had a place to stay, so did he. And if he had somewhere that was <laughs> these poor people, <laughs> seriously, like, um, I have a sister, she's going to be staying here as well. <laughs> So yeah, it was kind of a, a package deal. So we tried to look out for each other in that way. Um, you know, met people along the way that helped us or, you know, yeah. 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 So it was, um, you know, and, and I, I did have, especially in the last few years that I was there, have a few people that I, it, as best as they could genuinely cared about me. You know, I had um, one of my good friends. I kind of looked at her as like a mother figure, to be honest. Um, but I lived there, you know, off and on, but more more so in the last few years that I was there. And she kind of took me in. You know, she was my brother's friend at first, but you know, so I mean, you know, I feel like God provided in those you know situations as well because there were times where it was very hard and. You know, that's not an easy lifestyle. Mm-mm, it's not. It's it's awful. It's exhausting. Is what it is. I, I can't exhausting. even imagine. I can't yeah. even imagine how exhausting it must be. Yes. So, um, yeah. But I found out I was pregnant. 
Um, and I just, I, it was kind of shocking really because I hadn't, you know, gotten pregnant or obviously had another child since my daughter. And um, I don't know, I was just, mostly it was probably like, oh, it's just hard for me to get pregnant. Obviously I wasn't like being responsible and that's how it didn't happen. It just, yeah. I, I don't know. I don't know. But anyway, I, I didn't have any kids in between. So when I found out I was pregnant, um, I was, oh gosh, I guess it was 31 or two at the time. Yeah. And, and, and addicted at this time. Oh yeah. Yes. Um, very much so. Hardcore. Yes. And so, yeah, it was shocking to me. I was like, Oh my God. I like, I couldn't believe it. Um, I couldn't believe it, but you know, I tried to do the right thing. Um, I stopped shooting up and was just smoking it. I went from vodka to wine. Yeah. Go me. I mean, <laughs> I, I, yeah. I, I, okay. Uh, Ugh, I know it's you're, so you're, shameful. You're, I'm like, you're, you're, really? You're like, oh. you're, you're like, you're like saying this now years later going, sure. Right. Just repulsive. The, the, the addict, the addict logic at work there, right? Right. Very much like, so. Like just smoking's not as bad as shooting. Right. I'm, and yeah. wine's way better than vodka. Way. Yeah. 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 That was my, yeah. So, um, so I also, when I went to prison, got out and was on parole, you know, and can you believe I could not complete that? <laughs> I, I, can you believe it? I can't believe, I, thought, I can't believe they thought you would. I know. Like, just let me do my whole time. Uh, now, and I now, thought. Now you mentioned you got, you got arrested for paraphernalia. Mm -hmm. um, was that the only charge? Yes. And that's a felony charge. Yes. It will, you know, I may, I, yes, it is, but you can, all I got to do is a few things to, but yeah, I took it as far as it could go. Yes. Yeah. You're like, you were going to maximize this felony. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. But yeah, I, uh, I took it all the way. <laughs> so, and which I think is another reason that I was able to become a nurse with my criminal background because it wasn't. Like, like of all the things you could have been arrested for. Oh my gosh. Like of all the things you could have been arrested for, like the oh possession of paraphernalia is probably not a big deal. Mm -mm. And that happened in 2005, 2005. Holy and God. for, yeah. And I did so many things um, in between there that again, praise the Lord. He protected me from because yeah, yeah. I could have been arrested for so much worse you know? Yeah. So yes, but so, again, so, I, so here you are, you're addicted. You're, you're addicted. You now realize you're pregnant. You, you realize that there needs to be a change. You, mm -hmm. you maybe didn't make as much of a change as maybe now you would like right. to have. Right. Um, how did you handle that? Like, I can't even imagine your, your, your poor brain at that time must've been like, so like, how does this, what? I, no. I turned myself in into the department of corrections because I still had like four weeks left on my parole or sentence. So I, I had to turn myself in. Um, cause I wanted to at least have that out of the way because you know, that was, and that was so hard to do. It was horrible. Um, can't even imagine jail is for me, there was not one time I was there and I was like, whatever. I was so scared, <laughs> so anxiety ridden and in tears and hyperventilating and I am not for jail. Jail is, I'm scared. I was scared every time. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Mm -mm. No, mm -mm. I have no liquid courage. I was, I would freak out every time it was bad. It was really I can't bad. even, I, 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 I say, I can't even imagine I've been arrested once and, uh, and, and I was like 21 and I was scared to death. Yeah. Yeah. I was so, scared to death every time. So, yeah. um, but yeah, so I did, I did do that. So that was at least out of the way and completed. Finally, I was off paper in Arizona. Um, so I, you know, got out and again, just kind of the same, same people. I, there's no change in environment. There's no change, you know? So yeah. again, I tried not to do it as often. And I, you know, I even went to a rehab, um, I tried to go to a rehab for uh, pregnant girls, you know, that are, and I, I 
had a panic attack and I left like even change good change for me at the time I couldn't handle it I couldn't like I just would freak out and go right back to where I was comfortable it's all scary yeah yeah but um but my aunt reached out to me on Facebook uh and I called her and I I was about six months pregnant at the time um she and her husband at the time were pastoring a church out here and Um, And she just, and, you know, I, I was very close to her as, you know, childhood and stuff like that. So, you know, obviously lots of touch for a while, but um, she says, do you want to come tonight or tomorrow? And I'm like, uh, you're like, you're like, tomorrow. You're like, you're willing to take me in (laughs) for sure. For sure. Um, I was, but I, I, I knew that if I didn't do something drastic, I was going to lose that baby the same way that I lost my daughter. There's no doubt about it. And I couldn't go through that again. I considered adoption, but everything in me, I wanted to be a mom to that baby. I wanted to be a mom to my daughter, but I couldn't and didn't, but I had, I had this opportunity. I didn't really have that with my daughter, not an excuse by any means, because there's, there will never be a good reason as to why that happened. Um, but I said, yes. And I, I don't know. I just, I surrendered. I surrendered my life back to God, back to, I said, Lord, I'm, I, I surrender. I want to let you do whatever it is you want to do in my life. I am done. I'm tired. And I want to be a mom to this little boy. And I got on a plane and I came out here and I've never looked back. Wow. And so, you know, of course I had more troubles, you know, more things that I struggled with here as well, but I, that part of my life was behind me and I was very grateful for wow. that. Um, wow. Holy cow. What a story you have. I know. Hey everyone, Kevin McFarland here, and we will continue this episode later this week with part two. Be sure to be on the lookout for that. I want to thank Danielle for sharing her story with us here on the podcast. Holy cow, it takes an amazing amount of courage to get on here and bear your soul. So I really appreciate you doing that. It, it means a lot to me and it'll mean a lot to the audience. One thing that we know is that nurses are at a higher likelihood for addiction just simply based on access alone. Uh, if you are a nurse who struggles with addiction, I want you to know that you, uh, I would highly encourage you to get help just as soon as you can. There's a couple hotlines here that I'd like to share with you. One is the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration hotline. It's 1-800-662-HELP. That's 1-800-662-4357. And there's also a the Suicide Prevention Hotline. Um, Always a good time to share that as well. 1-800-273-8255. Until next time, be good to your patients, be good to each other, and don't forget to be good to yourself. Thanks for listening. Have a good shift.